Pencil Kings, 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 Pencil Kings. If you don't ask, no one's just going to give it to you on a silver platter. You know, you have to go and get it yourself. All right, we are back. This is the Pencil Kings podcast, and today we are going traditional, which is really cool because I feel like a lot of the times I'm just talking to digital artists, and uh, I know digital art, but traditional I don't know so much about. And so today I'm happy to welcome Nick Elias to the call. Nick, how are you doing today? Hey, Mitch. I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. And so just to fill you guys in, before we dive into Nick's you know, one-minute story, we're just going to change things up a bit, throw the throw convention out the window. Um, So Nick was introduced to me by Chris, who was the founder of Artisticon. Nick did not go to Artisticon, but he met Chris at Eluxcon. So this is another example of like how going to these conferences and conventions and little meetups and stuff, like all these things lead up to bigger things. So if you're sitting there listening to this podcast in your parents' basement, find a convention that you can go to this year. Like this is your challenge for today. I like throwing out challenges and things for you to do. See if there's a convention. It could be a Comic-Con. Um, Comic-Cons are kind of crazy. There's a lot of smaller ones that you can go to. And I, I kind of like the smaller ones because – you actually get to sit down and talk with these people instead of just having this roaring, noisy convention kind of overpowering everything that you want to do. Uh, this is how one of the ways that I got started. I went to a little meetup in a, at a university when I was about 16 years old. I borrowed my parents' car, and I went and we tried to create an animation. There was about 10 of us, I think. We tried to create an animation in a weekend, and that led to me – uh, you know, knowing somebody who led to my first breakthrough job where, you know, he could serve as a character reference. Be like, hey, I know that kid. He came in and worked at our – he came to our animation jam. So, Nick, welcome to the call. Uh, sorry for the long intro. Um, to start things off, why don't you give people a, a one-minute overview of who you are and, and what you're working on, and then we'll dive into your story. Uh, sure. Um, so, my name is Nick. I'm in New York. I'm a freelance illustrator in the fantasy genre. I'm working primarily in like tabletop games uh, and that sort of thing. Um, I work traditionally uh, an oil painter, and uh, right now I'm I'm getting ready to make that leap of faith into freelance illustration full time. Very cool. Yeah. So when we were talking before we, we we hit record here today, you were telling me that you um, last year you went to a LuxCon just just as a Patron, spectator, uh, an attendee, attendee, yes. attendee. That's the word that I'm looking for. Can you just tell us a little bit? I know we've had people talk about it a little bit, but uh, what was it like for you going to AluxCon the first time? I and and why is AluxCon different or better? I feel like there's a little bit more prestige with that con than than other ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, so AluxCon 2015, um, I I had graduated from my illustration school just about five months prior. And so I went as an attendee with my portfolio, and I just ran around the conference showing everybody, whoever I could get, to look at my stuff. And I mean, what I loved about that conference is that it's it's a small setting, it's intimate, plenty of opportunity to to talk to your favorite artists and get in front of art directors and um, just network and get to know everybody. You know, it it's a there's not a whole lot of big crowds like you'd get at a comic con. I don't know the numbers, so I don't really want to say like how many attendees versus exhibitors there are, but it's it was very small and intimate. You get to see the same faces over and over every day. And, you know, everyone's hanging out at night at the hotel, having beer and, and getting some food and just uh, having a great time. So it's kind of like a big party. And like when I went back this past year, it was like, uh, felt like a reunion of sorts, you know, seeing everybody again. So it was really great. Um, it was a great experience. And every, like I said, everyone took their time to take a look at my book, who I asked, uh, all the artists and stuff. And they would spend 10, 15 minutes with me going over my portfolio and giving me advice, recommendation, or um, pointing me out to an art director if they knew somebody that could uh, possibly give me work. And so it was really fantastic. And 
who are some of the, you don't have to name names, but like, what are some of the projects maybe that, that, you know, people were working on or the different titles? So I feel like when you go to a convention, you're, you're sitting, working at home, kind of banging your head against the drawing board, be like, man, I just need to get a break. Then you go to one of these conferences and you can literally like meet 10 people that are, you know, you've looked up to, or maybe you didn't know who they were at first, but you're like, oh, wow, you're the person that made this? Yeah. I didn't know that. But, and the cool thing is that you just get to meet and hang out and talk with these people. So, and again, I'm tr- I really want to push the people listening that don't go to these things. Yeah. Because I feel like it seems normal for me to go to these things. And I feel like for you, it seems normal to go to these things. But for a lot of people, they're, they're, they make all these kinds of excuses like, well, I can't afford it. I don't have time. No one's going to like my work. Yeah. You're like, there's just all these excuses and it's all just garbage. Even though, even if you're you're not ready to go, still go to meet these people. Then get ready in the following year and then go and show your stuff. But what, do you have any examples of people that you met who are just like, wow, I, I kind of can't believe that I'm talking to this person? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely, yeah. man. I mean, the art world is funny because uh, it's the fantasy genre is kind of small and you know it doesn't feel that small to me because I'm so involved in it. But it, when you really step back and look at it, it is a small handful of, of of people. So when I, you know, I have these like art heroes I look up to online and I'm very familiar with their work and to go and, and out of my little studio and finally out into the real world and meet these people, it's, I actually got a little bit starstruck, which is kind of funny, I think, but I remember one of my art heroes and I hope he doesn't mind me saying his name is, is Michael Hayes. Um, he's one of my favorite living painters and he, uh, he was at Aluxcon 2015 and the first night of the con, I was really nervous, but I took my book right up to him and I, I tried to get into a conversation with him. And he was so willing and helpful to you know sit me down and look at my stuff. And he actually pointed out three or four pieces in my portfolio. And, and at this point um, in time, it was mostly work that I had done in college. So it was kind of all over the place, you know, in terms of quality and content. And so he took a look and pointed three or four pieces out that I should remove from the portfolio for the rest of the conference because they were, you know, making, they were bringing down the, the um, overall quality of, the, of my book. So I had about 10 pieces and I think, I think I removed four. So now all of a sudden I only had a six piece portfolio, but it was much stronger because of the, the weak links were removed. And, and so I think that one fear people have is that you don't have enough good work. And when I ran my six piece book around for the rest of the conference and got pretty overall, pretty good reactions, I realized, you know, no one said anything about the quantity. Everyone was just paying attention to the quality of the work that I was showing. So, uh, you know, you hear that a lot, you know, less is more. And I think that that's really true. And it's, it's difficult to be a critic of your own work and, and, and really be, I guess, objective and and identifying your weak pieces. Maybe you have an emotional attachment to one piece or another, but to be uh, strict about it and objective as much as possible, um, it it really goes a long way. So so Michael uh, looked at my stuff and uh, helped me out. And then uh, right after I talked to him, I brought my book to Zoe Robinson, who's uh, a art director at Fantasy Flight Games or was at the time. And, she gave me work and she was my first step into the industry. So that first night of the con, I walked away knowing I was going to get work. And so that was just like an amazing start right off the bat, even though I was you know, scared uh, to do so. Um, so those two people really helped me get started right away. Uh, and then it was just from there, like I said, the running my book around, trying to get as many eyes on my stuff as possible and taking notes furiously and, and then going home and just uh, working on everything, all the feedback that I had gone, you know? Yeah, and I, I've got this huge smile on my face. I, I, I've i heard uh, recently, like, you, your portfolio is only as strong as your weakest piece. Yeah. And so I think that advice that you got is so good. Uh, and, and we... You know, we put together a course that helps freelance illustrators get their career started, and we recommend doing a four-piece portfolio to get started. Yeah, I mean, as you as you grow, you you know, you add pieces in, you replace pieces, but you you need four, and that's enough for the art director or whoever's going to hire you to really get a sense of what you can do, and that it wasn't just a fluke that you you pulled it off one time. And it also lets you remove some of those things that that aren't as strong. I'm curious about how the conversation went with Zoe, like. 
did she just look at your book and then say, call, contact me after the con, here's my card? Well, um, the way a lot of the reviews work, especially at a LuxCon, you can sign up for portfolio reviews with uh, art directors and artists um, in advance. And so I signed up for one with Zoe in advance. And when I went there, she asked me, what, it, what was I looking for out of the portfolio review? Before she even opened the book, she just asked me, you know, what do I want out of this conversation? And so I told her, I said, you know, I, I just graduated um, and I'm looking for feedback on my work. So uh, what you think I need to improve upon? And if possible, uh, can I get work? I, it was very, uh, it was a very open and honest conversation. And so she said, okay. We went through the book and she gave me her feedback. And at the end she said, yeah, if you want work, I can give you work. And so uh, oh, that's so good. Yeah, we exchanged uh, business cards and I emailed her the next day. I love that. And th that's something that we've started doing now that I notice people, and I think it's good to keep in mind, you know, like whenever you have a chance to show your work to someone, tell them what you want to get out of it because they don't know like what you're trying to work on. You might be working on your technique. Yeah. You might be trying to find work. You might be trying to get an IP off the ground. Yeah. But if they don't know that, then they can't, they might be able to tell you like, like let's say you're trying to get an IP off the ground and they, all your work is really sketchy and they look at it and they think you're trying to improve your technique. Yeah, right. But meanwhile, they could introduce you to a producer that's looking to buy a new IP and, and or, or to talk to people who are creating IPs, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and so that's so good. And so what we started doing now with Pencil Kings is like when somebody sends their work in, it's like, well, what are you trying to get out of this? Where, where do you want to go? And so I think it's so cool that you said that. You're like, I want to get work because I think a lot of people just ask for feedback thinking that they will be discovered, you know, by someone seeing their work and being so impressed that they're just going to offer them a job. Right. So they really want the job, but they only ask for feedback. Right. And so I think the way that you did it is really smart. You need to have intent um, and you need to be honest about that intent with everyone that you meet. Um, that I think that that's the best you know thing I can say about that. It's You can't be, you know, I feel like a lot of people, uh, you know, I'm coming up with a generation, obviously, every year there's a new generation of incoming new artists. And so that first year I was seeing a lot of people doing exactly what I was doing and you have to really just be honest and open about, about what you want and I, I would say I f see too many artists um, being shy about it, you know, they're afraid to ask but if you don't ask, no one's just going to give it to you on a silver platter, you know, you have to go and get it yourself and yeah, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> so that was the first year. Yeah. You did your the, some work for Fantasy Flight Games, and then the following year you went back and you got a table. That's right. Yeah. But why don't you tell us a little bit about how you how you get a table at a LuxCon? Because if it's something you think, oh, this is a LuxCon, it sounds pretty cool. I think I might check it out. I think I might get a table. You really have to be organized if you want to get a table. So what's the – is there a vetting process? Because I know they sell out really quickly. So could you just tell us a little bit about that whole process? Yeah. I mean um, so the, the Aluxicon main show is a jury exhibit. So you have to apply – it's usually in November of, of the you know year previous. So, um, so for the 2017 show coming up, the deadline to apply for the jury show was I think you know just uh, November – 2016 or something like that. Um, and then if you don't make the cut for the jury show, which is extremely hard to get into, then you have to purchase a showcase table for the weekend salon. Um, and that's what I did for the 2016 show. And there's no vetting process or anything. Anyone can show uh, their work. And the, the price barrier is really not high. I think this year it was like maybe $250 for the table. And you get three – no, I'm sorry. You get – two nights of, of showcase and so you have to but the thing is it sells out immediately because there's it's a small show um i think last year it was just over 100 tables in the in the salon or something like that maybe 150 so to you have to be online at like 8 p.m the night that it goes on sale like you know on your browser with your credit card ready signed into paypal already and like really just like Make sure your internet's good and make sure everything's working right. And, and because it sold out, I think, this year by 802 or something insane. So, yeah, you got to be you got to be ready. So you, what was it like this year going back as an exhibitor? 
versus last year as an attendee where you were walking around with your book? Um, it's, it was fantastic as, as a table showcase. Um, I still ran around the book with my book this year too, because what was, what was really great is they organize it in such a way that the main show is happening during the day, like, uh, you know, nine to five or six or something like that. And then the weekend showcase is in the evening at night from like seven to midnight or something like that. So everyone who's in the main show can then congregate over to the salon and check that out after, after dinner and vice versa. Like me as a table tabler in the showcase still gets to go around and check out all the amazing work in the main show. Um, and then in, in so far as like what it was like to be at the table, it was really unique. It was my first time tabling at a show. It was a little bit nerve wracking and scary. Uh, I had to prepare all my paintings with frames and make it look nice. And, uh, I made sure I had a nice table set up with prints and business cards and everything ready to go. And again, it, I think intent and purpose is key to having a, a successful show in general. My goal with the show was just to advertise myself, basically, just to introduce myself to that world. So I didn't really plan on selling anything. I had no expectations for sales. Um, I was looking at it as an investment, and and that's what I got out of it, and it was wonderful. Um, I met a lot of fantastic people, made a lot of friends, got tremendous feedback on my work. I did sell a few things, um, a couple drawings and some, uh, some prints, that kind of thing. But again, I didn't, I didn't make money really. I think I might've broken even with the cost of the table and that's about it. You know, it's, it wasn't a money-making thing for me. It was really just about being there and being in that world and, and introducing myself to everybody. And so for, from that perspective, it was hugely successful. That's so good. Yeah. So knowing that that's your goal, uh, that you you're advertising yourself and you're printing out all of your material, like the prints and everything. Yeah. What do you do with those prints when you're gone? Or how do you know how many prints to print <laughs> when, when that's not your goal, right? Yeah. If your goal was, I'm going to sell as many things as I can, like at a comic con, Mike Mignola sits there with a giant stack of Hellboy posters and just signs them all day. Mm-hmm. If that's not your intent, what do you, what do you go with? What do you? How do you prepare for that? Well, um, I I bought. Uh, you know, I did the prints myself. Um, I used an inkjet, you know, printer, the Epson printer at my uh, my college. Actually, I went back to my old school and used their printers there. They let me do that, and so I just bought like a package. I think it was of sixty sheets of paper, and I just made like ten prints of six of my best pieces. Um, I might have sold two or three prints. Uh, I just wanted to have something just in case people wanted to buy yeah. them. But yeah, I, I kept the numbers low and it was really just a, a guess. I spent most of my effort and, and money on making my originals look as best as they could because, like I said, that was my intent was just to showcase my, my paintings. Totally makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so let's change directions in the conversation a little bit here. You're a traditional painter and you know, I had a misconception. I, I don't, I don't say that I know everything <laughs> that, uh, you know, all, all the fantasy art or the majority of the fantasy art that's being created or that I see is all digital. Mm-hmm. And what we realize is that that's just the, like the way that I see the world, the, the websites that I go to and the articles that I read or the people that I follow are digital artists, but then there's still like you know, a strong traditional side. Um, what is it, what is it like, or, or can you just talk us through a little bit about what it's like to be a traditional uh, fantasy artist who's breaking in? Because I feel like on the podcast, we've had a lot of digital artists and not so many uh, traditional artists. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, like we were talking about a little bit before, I see it kind of through a skewed perspective because the artists that I follow are mostly traditional painters. So that's what I'm surrounding myself with. But when you take a step back and look at like the tabletop gaming industry, for example, it really is um, maybe like 80 or 90 percent digital work. And I think that there's some obvious advantages with painting digitally. I know that a lot of people tout speed as being the primary factor. Um, 
and I think that that's true. I do my color comps in Photoshop and, and I can do like a fully rendered color comp in three hours and have like something that looks really close to what my final painting is going to be. But it's, um, you know, for me, I can still paint fairly quickly in, in oil and I, I just love the process of it. You know, I, I think that that's what it is about for me. It's, just loving the tactile sensation you walk into the studio and smelling the paint and and at the end of the day having that artifact to hold and that's really important to me it's that's something that i just love is you know i have the object itself you know it, it exists and physically it's there um i love digital painting in terms of like what it can do and, and i admire that and sometimes i really do look at it and, and think to myself you know Maybe I should try digital painting more, but every time I do it, it's just not for me, you know. Um, I think it's a wonderful tool, but I just don't enjoy the process as much. There's something, there's, there's a disconnect there that I don't feel with the oil painting, you know what I mean? So uh, it's, it's challenging because I guess maybe I could produce more work more quickly with digital, but it's more important for me to have a quality painting that I love and enjoy doing, you know, and that's why we're artists, right? Was we enjoy doing the, the artwork. So, so that's why I, I've stuck traditional. And do you think there's, cause I know that, that there's definitely advantages to being on the side of the majority and, and being on the side of the minority. What are some of the, and, and by majority minority, I just mean that, the bulk of the work is digital, mm -hmm. but then there's mm -hmm. still traditional artists that are driving things and doing amazing work. What do you think some of the advantages are of being in the, the minority in this case? Well, I mean, I think with when you look at the end product of, of what the illustrations are for, there really is no difference. Um, when you, when you know, if you get a card from a card game, it's going to look the same either way, you know, on the printed thing, it's only an inch big and it, it does its function. But in terms of, I guess in terms of secondary income, there's, there's an advantage with illustrations because you can, I mean, with uh, traditional illustrations, because you can then sell that original painting uh, to a collector. And that is a big part of the fantasy industry. So LuxCon is, uh, going back to LuxCon, it's, that show is actually a traditional show, really. Um, in the showcase, there are some digital artists that show work, but it, in the main jury show, it's actually only traditional work. Um, it's like a gallery. It's like a salon. So, um, and it's meant for collectors. You know, that's the big market there is uh, collectors come in and buy the original paintings. So there is a huge market for that. And I think, you know, you can potentially get paid twice for the commission, you know, from an illustration because if you have the actual object, and, you know, there's no real advantage in either digital or traditional in terms of prints. You know, they both can be printed just as easily. And so there's, uh, you know, potentially unlimited number of, of prints that you can make and, and sell that way. But, you know, with the, with the traditional, you have that original artifact, and that's really unique. So, N Nick, I want to ask you now, as somebody who's just getting started in your art career and uh, you're extremely talented. If you go to EliasIllustration.com, and we'll have the link for that and everything later, uh, you, you can see that you're very highly skilled. How do you differentiate, differentiate yourself, or what do you put into your work that's kind of your voice or your spin on things? How do you stand out, I guess, is what I'm really trying to ask. Yeah, that's uh, that's the question, isn't it? I mean, uh, I'm trying to figure that out myself. I I think that this past year... I found that whenever I get an assignment, the first thing I do is is dig deep on on I guess like what it what what makes that assignment unique. You know, is it the, the setting and the characters, or the time period, or you know, is it the emotional content? Um, and then I just kind of I try to come at it from a place of reverence of for whatever that is. You know, whatever the subject is. And and by doing that, I get this attachment to the painting, you know, and I think that it becomes a sincere expression, I, I, guess, I suppose, if you come at it from that angle. You know, I've done jobs where I've not 
gone through that kind of process of, of trying to find something in there that I can really love. And when you do an assignment that's just, okay, I'm just going to knock this out, it, it never uh, comes through as strongly. You know, it, you, you fall apart, you know, and it shows. It really shows in the final product. So I think that, that the work that I have on my site, it's all stuff that I've been more successful at coming at it from that angle of, of, of respect and, and reverence of what I'm trying to show there. And, uh, and that, that's true for both my personal work and my client work. Um, and with my personal work, I would just add that it's um, trying, I think, this past year, I've sort of fallen into this uh, without really realizing it, but I'm trying to marry philosophy and painting together and having like philosophy inform what I'm doing with my painting and the message that I'm trying to convey because I think that what makes a person have a unique voice is really just um, what they're trying to say, you know, because everyone can learn how to draw, everyone can learn how to paint and that's kind of like learning your ABCs and then you need to know how to string together sentences and maybe that's like you can call that composition. You know who talked about this was um, Winona Nelson at Aluxicon 2015. She had a fantastic lecture on this and so I have to give her credit for that idea and it's um, but she said after that you know after you learn your ABCs and you learn how to put a sentence together then you've got to figure out okay what am I going to say? You know you have all those skills with the language and so I think that that's kind of where I'm at now is like trying to figure out for real, like, what do I want to say? What do I have to say? And that just comes again from a place of uh, a sincerity, I think, of wanting to say something that is meaningful to the human experience. And I think that's why philosophy and philosophical ideas have uh, come into play so strongly this year for me. Because, yeah, I'm an illustrator and, and I'm a painter, but at the end of the day, it's just, it's art, you know, it's, that's the important thing. It's, it's expression of the human experience. And so I'm trying to express, um, my experience. Well, I really like that. And I was wondering if you give, could give us an example or two of what you mean by reverence for the subject. Cause I feel like that's a statement that has a lot of room for interpretation, but if there's a concrete example, uh, it could be something that somebody could grab onto and be like, oh, I've never thought of approaching some of my own work this way, um, because I think we, we all have such different ways of, of doing things. Mm -hmm. But what, what does that mean to you, reverence for, for the subject or for the assignment or for the period? There, there's a lot of different things that you mentioned, but reverence was the word that was mentioned a few times. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, for me, there was a breakthrough piece, and, and that was uh, my the piece I call Ares, God of War. And that was the first painting I did after college, after I graduated. It was, uh, I did it, I graduated in May of 2015, and I painted that one in September of 2015. And um, I had done nothing like that in college. Uh, you know, I worked, you know, done realistic traditional oil paintings, but that painting in particular, um, it's, you know, the, uh, it's a portrait of, of Ares, the Greek god. And uh, I have, you know, I'm Greek myself, and, and so I was spent that summer really trying to dig deep on, um, you know, what do I want to paint? What am I actually passionate about? Because uh, when you're in school, you get all these assignments that are technical and, and helping you to improve, but there wasn't a lot of room for me to, to figure out, like, okay, what do I want to actually paint here? And so when I spent some time thinking about it. I kept going back to Greek mythology, to my heritage, to my culture. And and so when I decided to do Ares as a portrait, every little detail in that painting was thought through carefully because I wanted to get it right. Um, like that painting he's got, he's wearing, like there's a lot of uh, wolf symbology there. And that's because that, that animal has connection to Ares. Um, his armor is totally beaten up and scratched up and stuff like that. And I was trying to show there that, you know, he's been through countless battle because, you know, that's part of the character. Um, I made him a little bit older and um, gave him like a long beard and a little bit of gray hair in the beard and, you know, all that kind of stuff because I was trying to show uh, more of a I suppose more of the the Mars version of Ares, like the there's the Greek version of Ares, which is like the 
god of war. He's very aggressive. And then there's the Roman version where they call him Mars, and he's a little bit a little bit more constrained. And so I was trying to play like the dichotomy of those two versions of the same character. So, I mean, all of that just kind of went into that painting. And then on top of it all, I, or maybe underneath it all, rather, was that that respect for my own culture and, and that love and, and heritage there. So I think that that's probably my best example. And having done that in that piece, I was then able to say, okay, why is this piece so much better than everything I had done previously? And I was able to identify it was because of, of how I approached it. You know, it wasn't that I was even technically that much better. It was just that I, I approached it differently. Um, and so I try to do that now as much as I can. First of all, that was great. I think that was a great example. But do you think that when you go to that level in the beginning, that that then comes through and improves your technique as well because you're taking more care or putting in more time? Or is the amount of time that you spent on technique and finishing and rendering, was it more or less the same as any other piece? No, I mean, it was, it, I think that, that you, you hit it. It's, I, because I was approaching it that way, I did spend more time. Um, and I did take it further than I had taken anything previously. Um, I didn't, you know, and also, I should mention too, I mean, it was technically a, better than anything I had done previously as well because I was learning still you know I still am learning of course and I try to approach every assignment and say okay well what can I learn here what can I improve in this assignment you know and so for Aries I knew that I wanted to paint him with all like this metal armor and stuff so I had done a still life where I painted all like metal objects just to get a better idea of of how that is going to work and and so I, well, there was some technical improvement on in, in that way, but then there was also, like you said, I, I just it was just a matter, of, a matter of spending more time on it and being a little bit more careful with it and a little bit more conscious because I loved it so much. You know, I loved the subject and wanted it to be as great as it could be. Um, and I've continued to do that on every painting since then. You know. Oh, it's so cool. I'm just sitting here as we're talking and admiring all the little details and seeing. And I wish, you know, it's almost like so much art needs a, a placard beside it and say, like, here, notice all this stuff. <laughs> like, this is all intentional. This, the, you know, the wolf on the shoulder is not, it's not there as, as happenstance. It's not random. Right. The, re the reason why this arm is, is bare and this arm has armor on it, there's a reason for it. Because it's easy just to see it and dismiss. But when you start looking in, there's just a lot of little details. And I feel like for me, there's a lot of questions that I have, which we won't get into today because we don't have time. But yeah, there's just a lot of questions like uh, the composition and the colors that were used. And, you know, some of them are technique and, and other things are you know, it's just like, why did you do, you know, make this decision? Um, but without knowing that, you know, you, you can just, it's very easy to just look at these pictures and be like, OK, cool. Uh, a strong dude. Right, you know, right. And, and, and have said it's a strong game. Yeah, it looks cool. The end. <laughs> it, oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, well, we should wrap up here, but any any last words or any call-outs? I know um, you're, you're just getting your career started, so if you're looking to hire new talent, go check out Nick's work. Uh, I, th I think it's beautiful, and if you're looking for traditional painters, definitely. But any last words from you, Nick? Um, no, you know, I think we covered a lot here. Um, I would just say, I guess, if anyone listening wants to keep up with me, I'm, I'm most active on Instagram and Facebook. I'm pretty active as well, but Instagram would be the best bet there. Uh, so hit me up there, Elias Illustration. Uh, and that's it, I think. Cool. And the website's Elias Illustration as well. So that's E L I A S I L U S T R A T I O N dot com. Uh, and as usual, we'll have links to Nick's stuff over at pencilkings.com slash podcast if you want the easy to remember one. And that's it. Thanks so much for hanging out, Nick. I really appreciate it. And I wish you all the best with your career. And I hope we can follow up in, say, like a year's time just to see what happened. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love that, Mitch. Thank you. Don't demand patience. Years of practice. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration. <laughs>